Hey everybody, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. Now, I don't dip into the TNA well all that often on this segment, but I figured it was inevitable I would eventually cover this one. It's Victory Road 2011 from March 13th at the Impact Zone in Orlando, Florida. This show is nominated by based trucker Christian Calillo and Daniel Howell over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret. Now, above all else, this show is known for one thing, and one thing only is the disastrous main event match between Jeff Hardy and Sting for the World Championship. However, if you actually watch this show, you'll find there's a lot more crap on this show than just that match. Dig that promotional poster. Double your Kurt Angle, double your fun. By the way, Angle, nowhere to be found on this show. 17,000 pay-per-view buys, about 1,100 people in the impact zone. Mike Tanay and Taz are your commentary team for the evening. The show opens up with a no-DQ, false count anywhere matchup as Bully Ray takes on Tommy Dreamer. Now, Bully Ray at this point is a freshly turned heel. He just broke up with Brother Devon, broke up Team 3D during what was supposed to be their retirement speech, ironically. And so, yeah, Bully Ray is a single star for the first time in a very long time here in TNA. At one point in the feud with Devon, he even attacked uh, Devon's young sons, who we will see later in this match as well. On the microphone, Bully thanks God for Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan for knowing how to take a wrestling company to the top. More on what Bischoff and Hogan have been doing lately uh, later in this review. He claims to be tight with them now. Tommy Dreamer appears. Bully brings up their ECW past. He announces the match is no DQ. Dreamer is unperturbed and they start throwing hands. Fighting on the outside, Dreamer attacks Bully with some water and a big stuffed minion doll. Taz has no idea what's going on. He's begging someone to educate him. Weapons start entering the ring. Dreamer pulls out a blow-up doll from under the ring. Bully takes a 69 bump onto it. Nobody tell you know who. Today with a great one-liner on combat commentary after that though. No, not a three-way match. <laughs> Bully then hits a superplex on Tommy and elbow drops the blow-up doll which pops it. You sick fuck! You sick fuck! Bully clatters Tommy with a trash can to the head. Mid-beating, Bully grabs the mic and talks trash, says, This is for you, Devon! Out come Devon's sons, Terrence and Terrell. One of them's in a neck brace, even. Devon shows up and he and Dreamer hit Bully with a 3D. Dreamer wins here. I'm gonna give it three stars out of five. I think it was one of the better matches on the card, honestly. It was a great opening match. A wild, hardcore brawl with some funny moments peppered in and a pretty cool finish. Unfortunately, the feud with Bully and Devon would actually get kind of stopped prematurely due to what happens to a certain someone in the main event and how that kind of changes the writing for the group of Immortal. Bully Ray joins that group and starts feuding with uh, Fortune. That's one of the big storylines in TNA at this time is Fortune and an Immortal. Two big stables are feuding after they were recently actually joined forces. So Bully's with Immortal, feuding with Fortune. So Devon's not really part of that conversation anymore. Backstage, Chris Christy Hemi interviews the beautiful people and Winter. Winter talking trash about Velvet Sky right to her face. Velvet wants an explanation, but Angelina Love doesn't want to talk. From what I can tell in my research, it appears that Winter has infiltrated the beautiful people. She's been stalking Angelina Love for months at this point, and now she has Angelina kind of under her spell, and uh, it's basically causing a wedge to form between Angelina and Velvet Sky. We're going to find out how that plays out in this next match. It's for the Knockouts Tag Team titles as Angelina Love and Winter defend against Sarita and Rosie. Rosita, two-thirds of Mexican America, and Rosita, by the way, the future is Lena Vega. Sarita on the microphone says they're going to walk out as tag team champions. The crowd's pretty apathetic. She says the beautiful people are in the middle of a kinky love triangle. She speaks in Spanish. There's a USA chant. As the match goes on, at one point, Winter missing a big boot, kind of wobbly on one foot for a bit before she's taken down by some sort of invisible being. Very clunky match, this one. Not a, a good one to look at. A lot of botches here, and it really plays into the finish as well. Near the end, Sarita grabs one of the tag belt and goes for an attack, but Angelina cuts her off. We get some awkward scuffling on the outside. Winter's back is turned to Rosita, who takes all day to tease a belt shot on Winter. Very awkward. Kind of holds it over her head like she's going to whip her with it, and just waiting and waiting forever for Velvet Sky to finally stop her. Winter rolls up Rosita, but then Sarita counters it. Winter's down for like a day and a half as Hebner gets back in the ring to make the three count. Sarita and Rosita are the new tag team champions, but wow, that went downhill in a hurry. This was not a well done match. Like I said, it was botch filled, very clunky, and that finish was just, it was dreadful. This was ugh, not a very good match at all. 
Winter's mad at Velvet after the match, and Velvet tells her to, quote, chill out, Spaz. Later in the month, uh, Winter would compel Angelina to turn her back on Velvet Sky, uh, forcing the breakup of the beautiful people. And then Angelina would also help Winter win the Knockouts Championship that August at Hardcore Justice. We then go to the first of three segments on the night, highlighting what's billed as Jeff and Karen Jarrett's big honeymoon after they renewed their vows a week or two ago on Impact. Of course, it's not really a honeymoon so much as a family vacation, as Karen uh, disappointingly finds out because they're at Universal Studios and Jared and his kids are having the time of their lives and Karen wants absolutely none of it. We'll see how they're doing later in the night. Then backstage, Matt Morgan's being interviewed. He's got a bone to pick with Hernandez. He says Hernandez cost him the TNA Championship a while ago, so he's very mad about that. He will challenge the title again, he says, but for right now, he wants a piece of Hernandez first. We go to that encounter now. It's a first blood match as Hernandez takes on Matt Morgan. Hernandez is fresh off a stint in Mexico, now back at Impact doing the bidding of Immortal and beating up their enemies, most of the people in Fortune. Matt Morgan steps up and challenges him. The match begins in a big brawl. Morgan rips a turnbuckle pad off to reveal another pad. Hernandez choking out Morgan with a broken broomstick. He tries to stab him with it, too. There's a We Want Blood chant. Uh, meanwhile, Morgan has the biggest damn set of a back rake I've ever seen. Matt mounts a comeback, hurls Hernandez off the top rope. A fan then runs into the ring, but Brian Hebner, the referee, takes him down. In the chaos, Hernandez gets out of the chain, but his attack backfires and Morgan hits him with it. Hebner is also down the ramp now for some reason. Uh, Hernandez, who has been busted open, suddenly squirts Morgan on the chest with some fake blood. A new referee enters the ring, sees Hernandez first, who is bleeding, looks over at Morgan, covered in fake blood, then calls the match in favor of Hernandez. What the fuck kind of finish is that? I give it a half star out of five. It's not a very good match to begin with. And the thing with Hoss matches, they can be hit or miss. They can either be like, wow, look at these two big guys just beating the piss out of each other. It's awesome. Or you've got like matches like Hernandez and Morgan. Uh, and the thing that really makes it the worst is the fact that you get this finish, which, you know, I could respect a finish that has good intentions and then it's executed poorly. This one, even in theory on paper, is a bad finish. And they go through with it anyway. And it looks like it goes according to plan, but it still looks absolutely dreadful. I will give them credit though. The distraction with the fan, that was very convincing. I think it's the more you see it, the more you realize, oh, it's a plant because Matt Morgan's really staring hard at that fan. And then Hebner gets taken down and has a ref bump after the scuffle with the fan on the ramp. Like that makes it seem to me like it's a big work. But the way they sold it at first in those first moments was very convincing. So they had me for a second there. We then go to a backstage interview with one of the greatest tag teams of all time, Generation Me. There's Nick, I mean Jeremy Buck, and his brother, Matt, I mean Max Buck. And you know what? Today is Max's birthday, and he says his brother Jeremy's going to let him win the Ultimate X match. He's going to put the X Division title on his cake and says it's going to be Generation Max. Jeremy looks upset. Elsewhere, backstage interview with the X Division champion, Kazarian, and Kaz with a full head of hair is almost as shocking as seeing Generation Me. Kaz quotes Charlie Sheen's winning line, which immediately dates this show, and says he'll become the greatest X Division champion ever. Then elsewhere outside, Robbie E tells Cookie it's GTX, Jim Tan X Division title. You know what? I always associate GTX with Castrol, but what do I know? It's now time for the 24th Ultimate X match in TNA history for the X Division title as Kazarian of the group Fortune defense against Robbie E and Max and Jeremy Buck. Nice historical footnote. It's the first time in the history of the classic pay-per-view segment that the Young Bucks, the men who will become the Young Bucks at least, make an appearance. Then there's Robbie E and his valet Cookie. You know, sometimes you don't need to be subtle when paying homage to pop culture. Robbie and Kaz fight in the cable early on and Robbie's the first to fall. Cookie just screams the entire time. Max and Jeremy try working together throughout the match, but they're often thwarted. Some great double team work from them later on, though, as they do kind of a monkey flip into Jeremy doing a springboard moonsault onto Robbie and Kaz. Great stuff there. Max keeps getting close to the title, but Kaz finds a way to stop him, swings him off and hits a cutter. Kaz shoving Max head first into one of the columns. That looked painful. Tower of Doom by Robbie onto Jeremy and Kaz. A big-ass Spanish fly by Kaz onto Jeremy Buck. Jeremy Generation Me with a double super kick onto Robbie. They pull Kaz off the cables, and that landing looked pretty painful. Jeremy goes up for the belt, but then Max chastises him for it. Now they're fighting on the cables. They're slapping each other while hanging. Jeremy then falls. Robbie with a ladder attacks Max. Kaz crab walking on the cable as Robbie climbs the ladder. After a brief struggle, a little bit of a tug of war, Kaz gets the belt, lands in the ring, and wins it. I give it three and a half stars out of five. Of all the matches on the card, this is probably the best one of the night, especially in terms of just, you know, the action that you get and the excitement therein involved with such a, a wild stipulation 
matchup, but in terms of like, comparing to other Ultimate X matches I've seen, not the best one. I did like the internal strife, the story being told between Max and Jeremy Buck, and the finish was pretty creative with Kaz being on top of the whole truss, pulling the belt from below. It's time for another Jarrett family update. Jeff's got pizza. Karen, still upset. Backstage, Beer Money's being interviewed. The tag team champions try to get Christy Hemi to bend over for them, and they say they want to make a point about disrespect. They said that Ink Ink has disrespected them, and they're going to get back at them. That's not quite the same thing, though, is it? Beer Money now defending those TNA tag titles against Jesse Neal and Shannon Moore, better known as Ink Ink. Those two made a challenge to Beer Money on the Go Home episode of Impact after beating Generation Me in a tag team match. By the way, Shannon Moore here reading from what's called the Book of Dillagaff. It is a phrase, or at least a book, and a phrase that he has carried with him for many years in his career. Now, uh, the, I had to look at what it was. Dillagaff is an acronym for Do I Look Like I Give a Fuck? Some mutual respect between Jesse Neal and James Storm at the beginning. Neal's hair looks like he's wearing a helmet with a mohawk on it, by the way. The mohawk boys have Storm isolated in the ring for a while before James finds an opening. Hot tag to Robert Roode. Shannon Moore comes in and is a house of fire on both members of Beer Money. Roode shoving Neal into Shannon in the corner. Hits Neal from behind with what they call in commentary a rabbit style clothesline. You know how rabbits always be throwing clotheslines? I mean, I know he's referring to like a rabbit punch, but the phrasing of a rabbit style clothesline just makes me smile. A neckbreaker cutter combo on Rude, but he kicks out. Shannon Moore grabbing the book of Dillagaff, but it does no good. Storm hits a super kick on Jesse. Rude and Storm hit the DWI on Shannon. Beer money, win and retain. I guess one two and a half stars out of five. It's an okay match. Nothing special, but then nothing bad about it either, so at least it has that going for him. After the match, Neil's showing some respect to the champs once again. Again, but Shannon has none of it. Spray some beer in Beer Money's face. Ooh, the disrespect. Christy Hemi's backstage now with cold blood. Matt Hardy with his mentor, Ric Flair, and what a bizarre visual that is. Flair says to be the man, AJ Styles has to beat the man, that being Matt Hardy in this case. Hardy delivering his promo through half-open eyes, calling AJ young and naive, which, wait, what? Like, Matt Hardy's only three years older than AJ. He's only been in the business for three years more than AJ has, and AJ's already a multiple-time world champion. Who's young naive. Up next, Cold Blood, Matt Hardy, who's accompanied by his weird fucking braids and the nature boy Ric Flair, going against the phenomenal one, AJ Styles. Now, back in January, Matt debuted for TNA as the mystery opponent for Rob Van Dam at the Genesis pay-per-view. He beat RVD to prevent him from challenging his brother Jeff for his World Heavyweight Championship. Then in February, Matt and AJ had a match. At that point, Ric Flair turned his back on AJ Styles and the Fortune Group to join Hulk Hogan's Immortal Squad. It's so kind of a grudge match here. AJ with a hot start on Matt, but old Ric Flair trips him up, which allows for Matt to gain an advantage. It's short-lived as AJ hits a moonsault off the apron to the outside. Hardy slamming AJ into the apron, drives him into the turnbuckle post. Matt then tries to whip AJ into the guardrail, but then AJ slides underneath it like a friggin' T-1000. Matt distracts the referee while Flair lights up AJ on the outside with some chops. Flair shoves Earl Hebner and he gives it right back to him, because of course he does. Hardy keeps working over AJ, dropping him into the turnbuckle. Flair with a testicular claw, which Taz describes as five on two, one of the best calls Taz has ever made. AJ is able to mount a comeback. They daze each other with a double clothesline, followed up by an AJ Styles kick. They botch the moonsault into a reverse DDT. At that point, though, Flair's on the apron to prevent a three count. Flair's hit with a Pele kick. Hardy drops AJ with a DDT and a moonsault. AJ still kicks out. AJ hitting the spiral tap on Matt to win ultimately. And while the three counts happening, Flair keeps trying to get in the referee's grill. AJ hits Flair with a low blow for good measure, so Styles and Fortune win the day here. I give it three stars out of five. I think these guys have a really good chemistry together, and even though the match like wasn't absolutely flawless, and I think it did maybe run a little bit long at times, I think it was still an above-average match, and it was an enjoyable one for the show. And in a show that has a lot of not-enjoyable matches, this one's kind of an oasis. But uh, after this, though, for Matt Hardy, things would not get much better for him. He would challenge for the uh, Tag Team Championships later in the year with his partner, not Jeff Hardy, but Chris Harris, who made his big comeback after his embarrassing run as Braden Walker in WWE and that really went nowhere and then by June Matt would be suspended from the company and in August he'd be fully released from TNA after being arrested for a DUI.
In our final honeymoon update, Karen is snapped at Jeff saying that he's not paying attention to her needs and old Double J realizes what's been missing, her ex-husband Kurt and the man he's been feuding with for the last several months. Jeff wants to be the better man and call a truce with Kurt at impact. The whole family gets wet, much to Karen's dismay, womp womp. Uh, speaking of that though, when Kurt does come back to television, their feud only gets uh, more intense from there and it all leads up to a two out of three falls an ultra male rules match at lockdown the next month. Backstage, Mr. Anderson's being interviewed and he scoffs, scoffs I tell you, at Christie's claim that RVD's had an unfair shake of things. He says there's a difference between being an asshole and a douchebag. Douchebags finish dead last, assholes, that's him, finish first. We then move on to our semi-main event, a number one contenders match between Mr. Anderson and Rob Van Dam. The winner will face the world champion the next month at lockdown. Now these two both have a very legitimate gripe and reasons why they should be challenging for the championship. RVD looking to get back the belt he never lost. He was the world champion the previous year, but was forced to drop the belt due to kayfabe injury at the hands of Abyss and Fortune. Meanwhile, Anderson was the most recent world champion, but he lost the belt last month at against all odds to Jeff Hardy in a ladder match. He's been trying to lobby for a rematch ever since, but the network's holding him down for undefined reasons, as far as I can tell. Things begin well enough with some quick graps and some counters, and Anderson gets the advantage after a leapfrog botch. Whoa, Van Damme oh, went for the, yeah, the leapfrog and I meant to do that. follow up in the corner. Fighting on the outside, RVD missing the corkscrew leg drop and thwacks his leg on the guardrail. Anderson working the leg for the bulk of the match from here on out. Kind of an awkward moment in the middle of RVD's comeback where Anderson tries to catch him mid-rolling thunder. Van Dam kind of falls into a weird headlock on Anderson. You can hear Ken say, God damn it, before they try and get back on track. Fighting in the corner and they knock heads. RVD with a cross body and both fall out of the ring. A mic check by Anderson on the ramp. They're both counted out. The match is a draw. Boo, say the fans. There's even some dueling chants after this matchup here, like, restart the match, no, restart the match, no. That, that's hilarious to me. It seems the people who are chanting no, they can already see into the future and see what kind of train wreck is going to happen in the match after this. So maybe they just want to keep delaying the inevitable. You know, there's an apparent lack of chemistry between these two that really prevents them from getting out the gate in this one. But I do appreciate Anderson, like, working the leg throughout the matchup. However, Van Damme's selling of it really diminishes over time, and by the end, he's, like, not even selling the leg anymore. Uh, the disappointing non-finish, the double count, out. That really sucks. Although it does set up uh, the storyline for the next month at lockdown, those two will be in a triple threat match for the title against the champion. I wonder who it will be. And now it's time for the match you've all been waiting for, your main event for the TNA World Championship as the man called Sting defends against the charismatic enigma, the wrestling antichrist, as he's called at this point, Jeff Hardy. Here's a bit of background. Let's back up a little bit to October of 2010, when Immortal was formed. In the main event of Bound for Glory, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff joined forces with Jeff Hardy, Abyss, and Jeff Jarrett. It was hinted at for weeks that they, quote, were coming, and it turns out that they were, well, they. Then as the months passed, Hogan and Bischoff won a kayfabe court battle and stole control of TNA from under Dixie Carter's nose. Fans started seeing vignettes promoting 3-3-11 around this time, and on that day's episode of Impact on March 3rd, Sting had returned after a multiple month absence as Jeff's mystery opponent in the world title matchup beats Hardy to become the TNA champion. This is the rematch now that Jeff has time to prepare. We'll see if he's prepared. Jeff's music plays in about 40 seconds elapsed where he finally shows up from the back and right away you can tell he is not on this planet at the moment. You can see he just looks lost, confused, no energy, he's stumbling around. He looks like he can barely handle a walk to the fridge to get a snack, much less wrestle a match with Sting. According to reports, like apparently Jeff was like fine for the bulk of the show and then like in the moments before his match was up he was suddenly completely out of it in a worse case than he's ever been backstage apparently, unable to perform. It also feels very similar to an incident that happened back in December at Final Resolution. Apparently Jeff was in a very similar state, not really able to compete but he, he and his, his backers were able to convince them for him to wrestle because, oh no, it's not drugs or whatever. He's just as exhausted from the recent overseas tour they were on. So he was able to wrestle a 10-minute match with Matt Morgan that night. Not the case here. After the ring introductions, Eric Bischoff shows up and says there's a change of plans. He pauses mid-promo to relay the new finish to Jeff, then to Sting. Bischoff announces the match will now be no DQ. Sting bops Bischoff in the face, and that's that for him. The bell rings. Jeff spends a lot of time teasing a shirt throw. Sting runs out of patience, a one-sided lockup, Sting gets some shots in, forces his way into a scorpion death drop, shoot pin, the referee keeps the count, Sting wins. Oof. Hardy gets right back up and wonders what happened. Fans are chanting bullshit, Sting yells out, I agree, 
ladies and gentlemen, at this I point, agree. let's... Tanae and Taz do their best to stretch for time and recap all the match outcomes from earlier, but the show still ends about 20 minutes before the average. Lol TNA, everyone. I mean zero stars what else can you possibly rate this match you know if you're someone who like who enjoys like the downfall of wrestling companies and their worst moments big fan of schadenfreude there is some kind of like haha element to how fucked up this match was but there is no laughing matter about this i feel bad for jeff i really do because addiction is not something to be joked about or taken lightly very clear he needed help but this whole match this whole thing was a huge black mark on not only his career but also an embarrassment for sting and the entire company but also TNA shoulders some of the blame for this as well because they knew what Jeff's track record was like they knew what they were dealing with as far back as 2003 when he was fired by WWE for refusing to go to rehab and so he was there and then he, he burned out in TNA came back to the WWE and had a big push there he was a world champion then he screws up again comes back to TNA and he's in the middle of an indictment for drug possession at that time and then the whole thing with a final a final resolution happens like that was the warning and they failed to heed the warning and then this time at Victory Road, it totally blows up in their face. They were trying to sweep everything under the rug they possibly could, and they just didn't give Jeff the help that he needed or wanted, I guess. You know, it's like, you know, you could have, you know, the, a lot of people have said in, the, in, in retrospect, oh, they could have done this, this, and this. You know, they, there's a lot of other audibles. They really should have had, like, an audible for any kind of circumstance in the back pocket for if and when Jeff had a relapse like this. Uh, you know, even at the last minute, you could have had some kind of audible, some kind of, you had Anderson or RVD or anyone come out. And even though that match wouldn't have been good, it still would have been better than what we got. As far as the aftermath of this matchup, TNA did offer fans who ordered the pay-per-view like six free months of their video on demand service. And then Jeff was taken off TV, taken off the road. He was in rehab for several months, came back, uh, back to TNA that September. And I wish I could tell you that since then, he's been able to keep his nose clean and stay out of trouble. But as we all know now, not the case. He's been hitting some hiccups along the way, sadly, and hopefully, you know, he can still keep, he can keep getting the help that he needs. Hopefully, nothing as bad as Victory Road 11 happens for him or anyone ever again. My final grade for Victory Road 2011 is a D minus. This show was very hard to get through as a viewer. I would imagine very hard to defend if you're a TNA fan. This is clearly one of the worst pay-per-views TNA has ever done. Now there are some matches that are like okay on this show, but none of them are good enough to like save the pay-per-view, or none of them are good enough to make you oh my god I have to watch that match again. And everything else on this card is so laughably bad. Like the Knockouts Tag Team Championships, that whole match was dreadful, and the finish was worse. The first First blood match with Morgan and Hernandez was awful. Then that one-two punch of not only the bullshit double countout with Anderson and RVD, but the aforementioned debacle with Sting and Jeff Hardy. You know, that show, before the main event, the pay-per-view was already bad enough. And then that main event really dragged it down into the depths and made it just uh, one of the worst pay-per-views of all time. And it's crazy to think just how far Impact has come since then. Back in 2011, when that whole shit went down, I remember the internet blowing up. So this, is, this has got to be the end. This is the worst thing TNA has ever done. It's got to be the end of TNA. And, and granted, people have been saying that for years about TNA, but people thought this was finally going to be, you know, one of the things that broke the camel's back. But not so, because Impact still alive and kicking today under new management. You know, not quite as big and grandiose as it used to be, but it's still like, it's still pulling an audience. It still has a following. It's still alive and kicking. And that I think is very, it's, it just, it speaks to the spirit and the resolve of Impact Wrestling to be able to keep going as long as they have in in spite of one of these terrible dark days in wrestling history, and I'm not trying to speak in hyperbole when I say that, it just is, uh, by all accounts, a really dark day, at least for the, that company, because it made them look like total fools. But at least they were able to recover. Took a long time for them to get there, but they are recovered now. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Victory Road 2011. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review in the future. Next time on this segment, we're going from one of the worst pay-per-views of all time to what's considered to be maybe not one of the best pay-per-views, but one of the most successful pay-per-views that WCW ever did. In fact, it is the most successful one, Starcade 1997. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.